Welcome to the International Classroom Podcast, where we explore the world of education through a global lens. As a teacher, you know that every student has unique needs, experiences, and perspectives. And we believe that a global perspective is key to creating an inclusive and effective classroom. In each episode, we bring you insights and discussions from experts and educators around the world, sharing their experiences, the challenges, and solutions in the classroom. Whether you are a student, a teacher, or anyone interested in education, we invite you to join us on this learning journey. Now, before we get into today's episode, make sure to follow us on your favorite streaming sites to stay up to date on our latest episodes. If you're watching this on Deep Teaching on YouTube and you've yet to, please subscribe. We've been fortunate enough to have some fantastic guests on, so please do share this with your colleagues and friends and let us know who you'd like us to speak with next. All right. Thank you ever so much for joining me here today. Um, There's a question I start off with everyone I, I have on this podcast is, who are you and what do you do? Cool. Well, thanks for inviting me on. Uh, it's such a such an exciting thing to come do this with you. I am Sumbala Khan. Um, some people know me as Sumbal. I have a couple of variations on my name. Um, if a name tells you who you are, <laughs> there you go. Um, but I am a facilitator of learning experiences for teachers specifically um, and people who work in education. And how did you find yourself, how did you end up doing what you do? Yeah, it probably started when I was about five years old, a few teddy bears, a child who writes on all the walls a little bit too much, who's gifted a huge whiteboard that's probably ten times bigger than I was, and a couple of siblings that were um, uh, going to be the, um, the students of the future Um, And I started teaching them and it kind of just carried on from there. So if I wasn't teaching when I was in high school after that, secondary school, um, I was studying and I just loved school, loved learning and um, wasn't quite sure which degree I was going to do. So by the time it got to that point, I remember I I, uh, came across a a student in the year above who had just done a CELTA, ended up taking it. Great program to do for anybody like looking to get into teaching, a CELTA. What's so a CELTA? Cambridge English Language Teaching Certificate for Adults. That's probably not the correct acronym. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's known as a CELTA. It's a great program to do. And I did it before my degree. And that really gave me an entryway into teaching. So when I was about 18 or 19, that led to my first full-time role teaching in China of all places. Um, and uh, it was brilliant Uh, it was really challenging really interesting but uh, I ended up doing a language degree and all through that I again I was either teaching or I was learning and if I wasn't learning I was teaching and if it wasn't teaching I was learning and so it's just carried on like that all the way through Um, I did my master's after that at Oxford um, and I studied language policy especially uh for Uyghurs, who are the the ethnic minority of the far west in China, and um, looked at trilingualism and how language policy affects education, and um, and that gave me kind of a a bent on just design and curriculum and and research and academic research. And I knew at the end of that degree, I did a master's. I knew at the end of that, I kind of had been teaching all throughout, on and off for a few years, and I knew I didn't want to. Um, kind of I just wasn't sure where to go next and I hadn't really ever thought that there's other things you can do in in education apart from teaching and I remember finding out about um professional development and training and yeah how did I find out about that I think I um after my master's yeah not just professional development, but uh, publishing specifically. So I, I came into publishing um, right after my master's for Oxford University Press, who hired me um, into the regional offices in uh, in Dubai. And from there, I started working with teachers um, in more of a consultative or advisory capacity. And I remember because it was my first role after graduating, I remember 
lots of different people saying to me, you really, you know, you've got a lot of teaching experience, get some sales experience, get some other varied skills. And I remember a lot of people telling me that sales was a great role, like an entry role to just get a few basic skills down in your career. And um, it really was like since uh, that that role really, really helped um, in so many ways, especially with personal development. Learned a lot that year. Um, but yeah, all of that led me to, like in sales, I think you will find out eventually that you have to be a bit of a teacher in sales. You're convincing, you're influencing, you're listening, you're, you're wanting to make sure that people write that make the right decisions for them. If you're doing it with heart, you want to really want to make sure that people are benefiting from what you're trying to give them or, or sell to them. And because it was based in education, um, that really opened up my presentation skills and, and set me into the course of kind of looking at training and facilitation. And yeah, it was from there that I really got into facilitation specifically because speaking to huge audiences, um, it was a completely different ball game from teaching students. Completely different. Same in some regards. Yep. But whole new, whole new, whole new world. Yeah, whole new world. Yeah, and so ever since then, I've kind of been, I decided around that period that I, facilitation was the key skill. You know, at some point in your career, you kind of decide which skills you're going to do um, and which you're going to really get really good at. And facilitation was at the top of my list. So that's how, that's how I got here, really, in a roundabout way. <laughs> that's great. So for those listening, what's your sort of interpretation of what is facilitation for you? Facilitation, since I listened to your podcast <laughs> with, uh, with Joyce, it is, it's about leadership, actually. It really is. The more, I, the more I learn about it, it's about being able to take the lead um, in, in, a, in a setting where you need to help people get from one place to another. And, uh, yeah, it's really about... making the people in the room the heroes and and helping them get to that place where you need to go and to do that you have to figure out their goals like you have to know where they're going you have to understand them you have to be ready to really create an experience for them that's going to help them do that yeah so you must come across a real diverse range of teachers in all the different international settings so much so how do you plan and prepare for that <clears throat> So somebody else asked me a similar question. Uh, they asked me something like, um, would your planning be different for a group of teachers in China compared to a group of teachers in the Middle East? And I actually said no. Me personally, my facilitation technique for planning, um, every single group needs its own planning. Every single group needs its own, um, its own uh, focus and, and needs a kind of needs analysis. It needs... There's nothing, nothing I hate more than going into something that has not been designed with me in mind. And so every single workshop I do, even if some of the content is going to be the same and the objectives are the same, maybe it's my style, maybe it's jokes that I put into it, maybe it's certain warmer activities that I do, they're going to be changed based on the, the people in the room. And I think about them as a whole, like a whole person, a whole ecosystem, a whole group, whole community, and especially in the Middle East here, in, especially in the UAE, you can go to one school and all the teachers are from Pakistan, or you can go to another school and all the teachers are from 20 different countries. So I'm going to have to change certain things considerably for, for these different groups. So my planning, yeah, it would, it, my how do I plan for it? I ask a lot of questions before I go to the schools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I ask lots of questions. At this point, I've worked with lots of schools because primarily I work with schools using Cambridge resources and doing the Cambridge exams. And so I know a lot of these teachers now. And going back to them, when you know your teachers really well, you can, you can do more and more with them that's really tailored for them as well. So, yeah. Do you find there's any universal themes or similarities? Because you're fortunate, you, you kind of, you do get to move internationally and 
and us here, we're focusing kind of on the international classroom mm. and international teachers. And probably people, hopefully people watching and listening are curious, is there any sort of similarities internationally between teachers across classrooms? So I, my main work would be with the teachers in the MENA region, which is the Middle East, North Africa. And there are definitely differences from country to country across the Middle East and North Africa. There's differences in attitude. There's differences in uh, culture, of course. There's differences in teaching levels and skills. There's differences even in the types of resources they use. There's all kinds of differences just in the Middle East, North Africa. And I'm really fortunate, like you say, I'm so grateful to be able to work with all of them. But I'm also, occasionally I get the chance because my current my work with um, Cambridge University Press and Assessment, obviously they work globally. So I have colleagues based in other regional offices. My colleagues in uh, Southeast Asia, some of the workshops I've done with their teachers, completely different uh, to the ones that I do uh, for the ones in Middle East, North Africa. Um, I would say... I would say it's very similar to traveling. When you travel, you, you, you get, the, whole, the culture is going to be completely different. The same calls for attention you do uh, with, your, with your group in the UAE. It's prob it may not work for your group in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Malaysia. It, it, the, the way they respond to praise is going to be different. Teachers, it's the same in workshops. I remember a really funny um, example of this. I did during the pandemic, it went um, all virtual, right? Yeah. So um, it was really funny. I, I, was, I was doing a workshop um, for Southeast Asia. I can't remember the country. And I jumped on and uh, it, was, it was going well. Um, and then I started to see like the words clap, 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 clap written out in the, in the chat box. <laughs> Okay. Like, yeah, like yeah. written out. And I was like, I'll be around. I'll be doing a round of applause in the chat box yeah. with the word clap. <laughs> and, and they were. And that, and that was the, the whole culture. But that's a really good example of, of the differences, like tiny little details that you'll get in differences between teachers working in different, in different uh, contexts. And uh, if you imagine that's with teachers, how different the student uh, a student uh, vibe is going to be when you go into the classroom so um yeah culturally it's just very different I would say the needs are very similar like they they, they want everybody wants to learn it doesn't matter if I'm training in Southeast Asia with teachers there or in the Middle East they all want practical tips they all want to get better they all want it to be easier more yeah. than anything they want it to be easier to be fun like they, they don't want to be, they want to be the cool teachers, all of them. They, you know, the ones who, the ones who really have these like uh, amazing lessons that students want to come back to. That's the same across all the teachers I work with. They all want that. So the Cambridge, they've got some fantastic, they've got some fantastic resources to make your life easier then. They do. Like for, for me, I think the power of a book is, is huge. So I, I, for me, it's one of the reasons I started working in publishing because remember I said I'd worked in in um, in China and I was a new teacher then and the the my saving grace was the book. As a new teacher, that was my, like I was so glad I had a book and it was I think it was Cambridge. It was one of the ELT books um, and it just it was it was so important for my teaching the guidance some another teacher more experienced than me had bothered to write down <laughs> and tell me what to do and I could try it and tweak it it was unbelievably helpful so I know for sure there are teachers I work with who find these resources that Cambridge produces to help them with their delivery of particularly the the primary, lower secondary, but obviously we publish all the way through, um, through to IGCSE and, and above A level. And there's also ELT publishing, of course. But yes, yes, definitely. Um, and you, you'll, you'll know how important the book is, having written one recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know how hard it is to write one. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of teachers out there that uh, <clears throat> that want to, I think, and are doing it. Um, but you realize and mine was I had fantastic support mm. 10 months yeah 10 months to put together uh, a series for a year group so it's it's time consuming and then there's the other side of it the sales side that you talk yes. about um and for me obviously someone who works in the classroom 
I'm not cynical per se, mm. but it has to have value. Yes, um, it has to be practical. Yeah, yeah. and I imagine and then my next question for you then is the evolution of that. Mm. Because we get it in terms of people like physical books. I like mm. digital. In terms of obviously for as long as you've been doing that and obviously with COVID and everything we had, have you seen like an evolution in terms of resources and what teachers want and, and how they're starting to evolve and change? I would say, I would love to think that, you know, it all evolved through the pandemic to this magical place where every, every, everything is, is perfect. And, you know, now we, everyone is perfect at digital use of, of the books. What, I, what has changed is that digital is now a must in everything that I see coming out of publishers, whether it's Cambridge or any anyone else, everyone is publishing a print and digital. Cambridge have done something really wonderful, I think, which is make it mandatory that, that in the international education publishing, at least all the books have a code inside them that gives access to the digital and mo some will separate that out. So you, you, your book will be your book and then you, you get your digital separately. But I just think it was such a great move to make it a bundle um, for that. And to your question about what's, what's changed, actually, I, I call me old fashioned, but I think people are always going to need a print book. I don't know how to what extent. I don't know how you know, whether it's going to be every single student. What I do know is that in the Middle East, North Africa, at least, books are really important for a majority of the schools and a majority of the parents, especially parents who maybe don't speak English as a first language and that they know that this is important for their for their for their children and they they need a book as much as sorry as much as um the, the learners do yeah. um in fact maybe in some cases it's more for the parents in some cases than it is for the uh for the learner um and so i think books are going to still be very very valuable and important for quite a large demographic of of people of of parents and teachers and learners uh, in this whole shift to improve but definitely digital is has really increased I think teachers are a lot more savvy uh, than than before a lot more easy about teaching um, digitally about um, using using tools they're more open to mm -hmm. workshops online and um, they can tell the difference between a good workshop and a bad work they can tell all the difference uh, between um, the format of a workshop. They know how to ask the details, like, are we going to be on video? Are we going to be on audio? Are you going to expect us to write in the chat box? They know how to ask the right questions to, to gauge how much level of engagement they need, like, like what their setup needs to be at home. And I think this was not really defined pre-pandemic, and now they're, they're quite savvy about it. So what's a, what's a good online workshop look like? Oh, it's a constant work in progress is what it looks like for, for me. <laughs> constant work in progress I'm still working on this 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 piece where I try to get every single person in the chat box at least once to engage and that's been really really hard for me to get make sure I include everyone that's really hard a really good workshop is where the facilitator tries to do that and gets at least everyone on the call at least once to do something and I don't really mind what it is. I don't mind how small it, how how small the action is. But when you're online and you can't see your participants, small wins. <laughs> yeah, I'm going for small wins. <laughs> I'm like, sometimes I would just put the objective with a measure of success right at the beginning, and I'd be like, "This is all I want from you." At the beginning, I just I just want to get you out and and get your eyes on 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 this workshop because I can't see them. Yeah. Are so, you, do you find then? What do you find easier? Um, ooh, ooh, <laughs> with adults, um, ooh, it depends. There's so many, there's so many factors affecting the answer to that question. <laughs> well, it's just because like some, size of group, type yeah. of group, goal, objective, some, yeah. Some people go hands down face to face. Right. But I don't think it's that straightforward. Yeah. I really don't. I, I, it's about teacher energy levels. Are you giving me to? I, I, are you giving me their time and attention at the end of the work week, or do I have them at right at the beginning, when they're all like sparkly eyed, ready to go? Yeah. 
<laughs> like, because if it's Monday, I want to go face to face. Like, I, this can be brilliant. But if it's the end of the work week and they're kind of low on energy, dude, we might need to do a little virtual meditation before we start. Yeah. Like, like, you're going to yeah. need, it's a completely different, like, I, it's really hard for me to answer this question. I suppose the closest thing I can think of it for us is uh, parents' evenings. Yeah. Or parent teacher conferences. Okay. Like we've still stuck with doing the online ones. Yeah. So parents can be in the comfort of the home or at work, and I can be in the comfort of my home with my cup of tea or coffee and my biscuit, <laughs> my shirt and tie on and my shorts on. <laughs> and that's how I'm sat, because it's like you can't see under that. Yeah. And and there's an ele- an element then of comfortability. And also because you can go five, seven, ten minutes yeah. and that timer goes yeah. and then they're off. Yeah. Um and most teachers, when you speak to them, will be, you know, you'll see cues coming out of doors, parents. So it's, it's interesting to take in terms of what I'm, I'm, I'm really getting at is what has the biggest impact in terms of do you think it's more beneficial being a face to face for the level of impact that you want? Or is it actually, you know what, I can still get a high degree of impact through online workshops? Like I said, I think. And there's a lot of factors affecting it. And I really don't like being someone who says, hands down, always face to face. I won't do it. I jack, can't of, do jack of all it. trades. Yeah, no, I won't do it. I can't do it to people because yeah. I know myself, there are certain things for me personally, I prefer online, like you were saying, yeah. a, 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 like a parent teacher meeting. Probably online would be much better for everyone. Yeah. Um, a med- like a mediated meeting where you need to have like different parties involved online it's brilliant like you need to take a break you can take a break like you know the physical energy or like of others in the room affecting you i think not enough attention is given to energy in teaching there's not enough enough attention given to it and also the objective often at cambridge for example we have a certain um a certain type of workshop that we do that's called an orientation to the books so, for example, I wanted to use your book, but I'm completely new to it. I've got a whole team of teachers at the schools. We just adopted your book. Would you come and just walk us through, like, what what was the thinking behind it? Where do we find everything? I, I need to know how to get into the digital part. I need to like that's an orientation. You do not need to be in person for that to be no. highly effective. In fact, it's often more effective if you do it online because you can have the teachers on their laptops following along so they can see everything um engagement for that is through the roof when there's like i would say when you want community when you want like a a a really lasting experience like you want people to have wow like like this is was amazing when i want teachers to feel like a student again when i want them to have a, a sparkly eyed moment where they've they've maybe shared something they know with another teacher, I would say I prefer in person for that type of experience. So it's about the, the objective, the experience, what, what's the goal of, what, what's the purpose? I just like things to be really efficient. Like I like us to know what we're, <laughs> know what we're doing yeah. and know how we're going to use this time and then make sure we have optimised it for efficiency, taking into account everything the energy, the objective, the the goal, like what what what's really, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, it's nothing worse than sitting in a training. Like, what am I doing here? Yeah. Like, what was that hour about? I, I, like, you don't even know sometimes at the end of a training. Can't stand it. I think we have too many of that in, in education. Oh, yeah. um, I think we've got one, a bit too many and we need to differentiate <laughs> for teachers. Oh, yeah. I really do. I think... We worry about doing it for learners. We need to do it more for teachers. Yeah, and that's been a theme of mine, I think, for the past couple of months. Mm. Like, and everyone I've spoken with, and whether that's through the podcast or online, and talk about it. And it's like, it sounds so simple. It sounds such like common sense. But actually, like you've hit the nail on the head, is that we don't. It's amazing as educators, we spend such little time focusing on learning mm. for teachers. For teachers. It's all about performance. Yeah. We're a, we're a performance-driven profession that then spends minimal time on actually teachers learning. And teachers get to a point now, in my experience, if you've got a, a, you know, a poor PD program mm. or you're getting forced to sit through an external speaker yeah. who actually doesn't really care about yeah. that delivery or can't, hasn't upskilled themselves and so on and so mm. forth, 
teachers start to resent it. Yeah. And it's an interesting one. They did a bit about cognitive load, especially if you go through things that teachers have already done. Yeah. It's like you think, oh, hang on, cognitive load is about overloading. It's like actually yeah. it takes them down in terms of they completely switch off because there's no engagement, there's yeah. no value. You know, this idea of andragogy and skill sets mm. and being able to utilize them, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a decline. And I think we're seeing more and more teachers now openly saying and wanting to take control of their own professional learning, um, which I think is a great thing. They need to do it. Yeah, it needs to happen. I, I think teachers... I was thinking, I think so much about this too. In, cor in corporate, in any organisation where you have professionals, you have so much time dedicated to their professional career progression, to their career advancement. I mean, Cambridge University Press Assessment, brilliant. We have Love to Learn Week recently. A whole week just encouraging professionals in the organisation to consider their own learning and make, you know, attend some of these amazing sessions. Like there were cooking classes, there were all kinds of things just, just for employees. It wasn't about anything other than figuring out something that you want to learn as a learning organization. You know, they thought it would be a great idea to make sure that employees are still learning. Yeah. <laughs> when do we do that for teachers? I've rarely come across, I saw a PD program recently. I looked at the whole, I was like, where? Where is a single session that focuses on the teacher well-being or a teacher IEP like that, yeah. that isn't related to like a, a exam yeah. exam Results connected or... result that is student connected? Where is something for the teachers that takes care of their energy, their personal goals, their interests and their career? Where is it in that PD program? And I would hazard a guess to say that that PD program I got a glimpse of is very similar to many around this region or at least internationally in, in these schools. I think in the UK it's a little bit, uh, maybe from my experience working in a school there, there was a little bit more on, on personal growth and, and personal interests as well. But certainly in the Middle East, North Africa, I'm like, where, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> I can. I think it's it's very hit and miss, depending on what the institute you work for or what school company you end up in. Yeah, it can be very hit and miss. But I love that initiative, the Cambridge Initiative you mentioned there, and it kind of feeds nice into my next question about Cambridge initiatives and things that you think are having huge, a great impact out there. What are the types of things that you've seen from Cambridge the initiatives and the resources or things they're trying to do to really excel and develop people? Yeah, I think. There's so much work currently around AI uh, has been happening a lot at, at Cambridge, lots of discussions about um, ethics also in AI. Um, and obviously um, Cambridge needs to lead on a lot of a lot of thought thought pieces around really you know happening and and current issues affecting education. So something that has really been um, interesting for me to, to see and hear about is the ethics question in AI, which which has been there. Um, not my forte, um, but you ask about, you know, what, what's happening in terms of thought uh, thought and, and progression. Um, another thing is the joining up of uh, resources plus assessment. Uh, so um, Cambridge University Press and assessment recently merged. Um, that has been another step towards really um, a holistic approach to um, serving schools and, and helping advance education and imp learning outcomes for students as well. Um, because I think when you have, you know, an assessment goal, it's only natural that you, and Cambridge is great for this, is filled with people who are just so passionate about making the tools and making materials and 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 training programs that will help teachers to really deliver on those goals and and create uh, great learning experiences for for um, in the classrooms. So, yeah, I hope that's answered it. It has. It's kind yeah. of gets me thinking. Then is like, is that then going to change professional learning? Mm. Do you think those things are sort of are going to impact not just the how, but the what teachers need professional learning on? Absolutely. I think I think whenever you go through any kind of merger, you're looking at huge opportunities to bring the best of what all of these incredible, um, you know, 
achievements in resources and materials are with all of these um, amazing uh, and the, the amazing work you've done with assessment. And when you bring those two together, there's so much opportunity for for you know pulling back all these ideas from both from both elements and it's really interesting to be a part of that when it's still in transition and going that way um but yeah I see great I see personally I feel the future is learning communities I feel the future is really developing teachers professional development in Cambridge I've worked in different publishers around I've worked in Oxford I've worked with GEMS Education, and I love that there's always a training element to the organizations I've worked with, but I have never worked with an organization where so much time, energy, resources have been given to professional development. And it's one of the reasons I love working with them, because to have even to have my role based in region tells you a lot about what what matters to the organization and and not all regions in publishing and in assessment, international education will have a role like this based regionally. Not all of them will. It's not a guaranteed thing. It needs to come from a certain level of, of uh, deciding about what's important for what's important in education, what's important for this, you know, this, the landscape of teachers in this region. So it tells you a lot. No, oh, most definitely. Yeah. I think uh, like we said about you're going to be, you're the person so having worked with a few different publishing companies and I often more get the sales yes. side of things. People yeah. want to use our science books. Can we come in and do this? And mm. I'm more sometimes going, how have you got my school email? How have, that's my first response. If someone emails me and it's like, I know I've not given that out. How have you got hold of this? But it's a, it makes a big difference from, from my side if who is the first person through the yeah. door? Who is the first person I see that represents this company? Because that then tells me everything... I'm interested in about this company, this yeah. publishing company. And at the moment, as it still stands, you know, we still have to use, you know, exam boards. We're still, and then this whole thing is up in debate at the moment about, but that representation and, you know, what they stand for yeah. and what they offer and how they reflect and talk about it is a, is a big thing. Mm. So, so to know that and to, to hear that about Cambridge is, and it's actually probably the only, I think, exam board I've not worked with. Hmm. Used Oxford um, hmm. at GCSEs, done OCRs, done AQAs, done uh, Pearson, really? IB. Yeah, I'm all, <laughs> I'm well travelled when it comes to different exam boards. They're not and, Cambridge. No, oh, that's really interesting and ironic. I know. Yeah, I <laughs> probably know. a good thing. Yeah, the book, the, the book. <laughs> For I, this conversation, I mean, I, I know, it's, yeah. it keeps us both fresh. <laughs> But the book, the book you mentioned earlier that I, yeah. I'd written, that was for sort of the Cambridge assessment. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was very similar to my to like one of the uh, but NYP I thought, approach. I assumed you. I assumed you taught it because I, I knew that about that book. So, no, yeah. no, no, no. I think, as I say, I drafted it, but it was, it was more That's my really NY, NYP background because they wanted concepts yeah. and they wanted to, a lot of education. And you might, you may have seen this as you've mm. gone through it in terms of what things are there and how it's shifting. Yeah. Because when people ask me, having taught at such a spectrum, especially across mm. IB and then GCSE, mm. like I would still say GCSE. Mm. is hugely content driven mm. and i know they are changing the myp into the dp but so much more skills and inquiry mm. like that's the big thing inquiry based are you seeing any shifts in that way hard for me to say being very much focused on the, the i like the the cambridge side of things because i've been pretty much immersed and I, I definitely know that that's the case. Like when we do our comparisons and we look at the different curricula, yeah, it's definitely the case. I would say we're definitely trying to move towards more concepts and more inquiry-based learning, more project-based learning. Um, the projects are a big one, yeah. definitely a big one that just wasn't there in, in a lot of the previous publishing that we used to do at Cambridge. Um, uh, and it's it's it, we talked to so many. I think there were thousands of teachers involved in interviews and and uh, feedback before they made the you know the equivalent of the of what you did that yeah. the equivalent for Cambridge. Um, I know that so many um, teachers were interviewed and all of them were asking for you know pedagogy. We want to know um, really how to teach this. Yeah. We really want to know how to take it out of the book. 
and teach the activities. And a big one that came from that research piece was projects. And I think that's the key, um, a key uh, that signals a key shift that takes you more towards kind of what you're talking about. You've noticed the difference with MYP and IB being more concepts and, you know, like that. And I definitely see shifts happening in that regard and definitely with the, the professional development too. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that was great. I think a lot of teachers want that. They want mm. PBLs or problem based or mm -hmm. project based. And the same with teachers when we talked about training. It's like they want scenarios. Yeah. They want to be able to model it and, and go and try and do these things. So yeah. you know, it's you're gonna probably see if you change the curriculum, you're gonna see a shift in what is the personal I mean, professional learning and you're gonna see a shift in output from teachers. But I find it sort of moving back and forth really interesting what you said about like professional learning or networks, these PLs, because I think that's one thing. I've noticed more in Dubai, more than any other country, is that there is that, mm -hmm. or in terms of it's such a small, yeah. collaborative sort of. Every teacher seems to know, or six degrees of separation, someone else here, or someone who works it's there, really or someone funny. who does something. Yeah. It's great. Like I think I've got some, I've had some of, or put myself into be involved with some of the best like professional learning I've had more so than UK. Mm -hmm. There's things that I've come when I've come over here. It's like oh, I didn't know about that, and I mm -hmm. taught 10, 11 years before I even moved here. Then to go, oh, I've, this is the first time I'm hearing of these things yeah. out here and more people are pushing for it. Yeah. I think it shows the standard and quality of, of educators that we do seem to have out here. 100%. Um, it's even changed. Uh, have you been out here since? 2015. 2013. So yeah. similar time span. But I have to say, in the last few years, that community, the, the quality of what is exchanged in terms of ideas... The number of educators on LinkedIn sharing their work, thinking out loud, learning out loud, sharing out loud. It's been wonderful. Yeah. It's been wonderful to see. Even yourself, like you said, you're fairly new to, to kind of sharing the work you're doing. You know, in the last six months, this is where your podcast has really yeah. been developing. That This alone for me, like sometimes you just need one <laughs> one more addition like one contribution to to a small ecosystem to you, you had a quote recently something like when you raise the level of one teacher you uplift the profession as a whole yeah you said something like this uh it may have been I'll, me i'll find it it was you definitely you it's yeah. it definitely you because i wrote it down and and it was about training it was a, i'm sure of it and that's what's happening here i think as we've got these really highly skilled teachers joining the international teaching community in this region and in the UAE specifically, it's just, it's so exciting. Like the, the stuff I've learned in the last two, three years, especially since the pandemic, I think it just, when I first arrived, the, the training needs were very different. Yeah. Um, uh, and talking about schools that maybe weren't at the top tier of of having access to, you know, they're not the socioeconomic, the high yeah. high income schools. The schools that I work with the most are those mid to low socioeconomic ones that really, like, you have teachers there who have not necessarily done a teaching degree. There's a great demographic in in this country alone, but also in our region of teachers like this who pivot into teaching because the cost of living is high here. Yeah. The, the family needs are high. The students, the, the, the children need to be in school and the, the parents need to be working. And for mums particularly to go in and teach, it's a, really, it's a really convenient job to have. And with that, you have kind of like a twofold. You have therefore got teachers who are maybe not that experienced or they have amazing knowledge of business administration or they've got an MBA, but they haven't taught in a school before. And they need like almost... The, the basics need to need to be there. So when you ask me like how's it how's it changing and and what like what what do you see as the needs? It's very different from from group to group, from to, from school type to school type. You know that and that type I've just that case study like a snippet there is quite a large. It's quite a large dem, like uh, uh, group yeah. in, in in our region in the MENA region in in the UAE, um, and it's getting better. It's getting better and better because these are teachers who, like, I feel like I've grown with many of them. Many of the teachers that I met when I first arrived, I'm still in touch with. And, and we continue to grow and learn together. And, like, you just pick up these, these characters along the way, don't you? And you just keep, it's like a learning community. It yeah. really is. It's been brilliant. Yeah. So what strategies, let's say, you know, 
you're in these schools and you, you've got sort of relatively new teachers coming in and they're coming to you and it's like, what, what would you recommend? What, what, what should I be doing to grow and develop as a teacher? Mm. What would you recommend to them? A book. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sorry, you, you need, you need, if you haven't taught before, remember I said when I first started teaching, I just got my qualification. But the thing that was saved me the most was having a book, like to, to, to give me guidance. I didn't have anybody in China with me at that time. I was really fresh in the country. I was fresh to teaching. And the thing that helped me the most was some, somebody, this author, had taken the time and the trouble to write down things, activities, ideas to start with, and a little heads up. You might have students who like this. You might have them oh, like yeah. that. And here's what you do. And it was just like a little roadmap. So for a new teacher just joining, that's what I'd say. Get yourself a good guideline. Like this is what you're going to need. Pick one well. Uh, there's loads of people in our industry and in in uh, in the UAE even who can help advise on that. And um, and get that down. Um, and in in that, look for look for quality of instruction so look for someone who has written this book with a heart for pd and professional development who has taken the time to say hey while you're teaching this unit here's something you can work on with your professional development Hit, be good. Hit, and that's in our books <laughs> oh, <laughs> and that's why i love it i love it <laughs> no it's you asked me what would i do yeah. if i was a new teacher i would get a book like that because oh. i need to simultaneously teach but i also need an idea for how to develop myself so um, that's what I would do. And then I would connect. I would connect with get your favorite trainers down. So for me, I, I know who my favorite trainers are. I go to all of their sessions, even if it's a topic that I know about already. And, and just follow follow them. <laughs> Chase them like your life depends on it. If you're a new teacher, the amount of generous giving people in, in, our, in education, you're not going to find this really the same way in other professions, I don't think. Yeah, Teachers have a heart and yeah. particularly professional development trainers, they have a real giving streak that makes it very easy for you as a new teacher to go and just tag on, jump on the train, follow them, keep up and, uh, and get yourself uh, learning. But I would also say get on a professional development course as soon as you can, like really... You, you, if you've never taught before and you're, you're new to it and yeah you have a degree and you might have a little bit of experience you need to really like hone your craft as it were yeah you get the get the basics the fundamentals down and um there's so many different things obviously i work with cambridge so there's lots of plugs going on here that's what we're here for it's all good <laughs> so uh uh no we have so many things and, and like i said we've just joined up so i'm learning more about the assessment related professional development you can do there's tons tons of it there's um uh, huge courses that you can do over time um there's i know from the from the publishing side as well we're always we do a lot of um of intro courses and like and, and sometimes free and sometimes community building events and even from those you can get so much as a new teacher you can meet a new friend you can you can learn about the things that publishers are doing internationally or qualifications teams are doing internationally yeah and sometimes they give certificates <laughs> who doesn't want a certificate exactly. in education exactly. it's like the biggest the second biggest question i'm always asked is, is there a certificate, a certificate? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah love that yeah that would be it it's like yeah a nice little seal on the bottom yeah amazing amazing but something just from listening to that last part you speak about it, it's obviously something you're very passionate about yeah i love it and, and so just to, to wrap up and this is kind of my last question is like what is it that you find the most rewarding aspect of your job that kind of gets you up in the morning and keeps you going back there i really love the connection with teachers and other educators so as a person who loves learning um that is a shared love with other teachers. And I pretty much know I'm going to be around people who also love learning when I'm working with teachers. That they're, they're interested in it. They like thinking about it. They don't mind geeking out about it with me. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's one of the best things um, uh, about my work is that I get to talk and engage with other incredible educators about a topic I'm passionate about and interested in um, often. And that's wonderful. Yeah. I think it's something like we've connected obviously over social media and seeing the work yeah. that you're putting out there and 
and what you're doing with it. It's obviously something you're tremendously passionate about and something you model extremely well to the people you work with about being a lifelong learner. Yeah. So it's been an absolute pleasure speaking today. So thank no. you. Thank you for your time and yeah. coming to share your stories with us. Thank you so much. I have to say, yeah, I just I've learned so much from you as well. The podcast, your, your, um, some of your articles as well and, and have really helped me continuously improve in the last six months alone. So thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the International Classroom Podcast. I hope that our discussion has provided you with some valuable insights and perspectives on education from around the world. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe on your favorite streaming platform to stay up to date on our latest episodes. If you've got any feedback or any comments or suggestions for future topics, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us on our website or on our social media channels. Remember guys, education is a lifelong journey and we're excited to continue exploring the world of education with you. So don't forget to subscribe and we will see you in the next episode of the International Classroom.